Welcome back to Sabbath School Boot Camp. We are covering Lesson 7, The Covenant with Abraham, today. And finally, I can just say Abraham and not get tripped up trying to say Abram. I'm joined once again by Jim Merrills, our elder emeritus extraordinaire, whatever, 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 in Michigan. And uh, we hope to have another fruitful discussion with our 25-minute countdown. Whew, that worked really well for us last week. Let's try it again, Jim. Here we go. Woo. Wow, that word Michigan really came out of those lips pretty easy this time. It's hard. I watched the NFL draft. I saw Aiden Hutchinson go to the Lions, so at least he can stay in that prison. Okay, <laughs> we're talking about the covenant with Abraham today. Critical, critical, critical moments in Abraham's life. Some of the most well-known stories are going to be um, here in, that we're going to cover in this week's lesson. So let's get to it. We're going to head over to Sunday right now. And we're meant to look at Genesis chapter 15 and compare it with Romans 4. The question is, how does Abram reveal what it means to live by faith? Hit us off, Jim. Well... <clears throat> no pressure. I, I have some good notes, but uh, you know I'm gonna I'm gonna roll into Sunday here to talk about faith. Okay. Oh, yeah. Hit us All with right. it. So we'll we'll, we'll just kind of jump right over. Well, no, no. Let, let me let me throw this in before I get to faith. Okay. Something that I have heard Christians say, some Christians say, is Allah is not the same as the God of Christianity. You're going to get into this. <laughs> I, 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 I'm, I'm jumping with both feet right here at the start. <laughs> okay. but, but this, this really struck me from the lesson this week. And actually this, this came from the, uh, from the sister companion book where Dukan is writing. Mm -hmm. And I'll, I'll just quote him. He points out the reality is anyone can say Abraham is our father. And that really struck me this week. Whether you're Muslim, Jew, Christian, all of those see Abraham as the father. And the text tells us that he is the father of many nations. Yeah. Thus, this gives Dukan the, the, the basis. And, and keep in mind now, this week's study, I think we're in what, lesson seven. Yep. But this is like part two of three parts on Abraham. Yeah. And so I was really struck by that when he said, anyone can say Abraham is our father. That, that, yeah. that was just a statement right there. Yes. Yes. Okay. I love that. Mm -hmm. Now you mentioned about faith. So I'm going to pour right into Sunday here and I'm going to bring up uh, an issue here about faith. Okay. Uh, again, again, this goes to our companion book. Okay. So the, these are freebies here that we're throwing in for the Sabbath school teachers who may not have the companion book, but, Dukan brings out that this word for believing in the Hebrew, like a hiemen, all right, that this word for believing is more than a mere reference to a creed. In fact, he mm. says it's not, it's not even this idea of naively just swallowing anything that comes along. And we have seen that. We have seen in Christianity where people say, I believe, I believe. But it's like, what do you believe? What, 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 is, what is the foundation of this belief? Yeah. And Dukan goes on to say, this kind of belief, in fact, this faith. And I wanted to highlight this because mm. if you think about it, you and I do not say in the English, I faith. <laughs> okay? We yeah. don't. We, we are limited to, I believe. Mm -hmm. And so when, he, when he's talking about this word, of believing with relationship to Abraham, he points out that this is a historical and relational aspect behind this word. And so for our viewers this week, I would just like to throw out, I like to use the phrase, I faith, because mm. it separates, it distinguishes from just any old, I believe. And so when he pointed out this word in relationship to Abraham, I could so appreciate what he was saying just because of my own view on the word I faith or pistis in the New Testament. Yeah. You know, I'm going to take this image of Abram as the, the, the kind of the, not stereotype, but the, the type of all the faithful, because that's what Paul is doing in Romans 4. 
And I, I yeah. think sometimes we as Adventists, we, we, we talk about a final generation because we're on this end of Earth's history, and we talk about how they need to be perfect. And yet when you look at the people in the Bible whom God considers to be paragons of faith and of faithfulness, like David, like Abraham, you realize how imperfect they really are. So evidently, the perfection to which we are called, I think, is, is, is embodied by Abraham, embodied by David, embodied by people like that. Um, it doesn't mean we're called to make the same mistakes they did. Of course not. We, we're always striving to, to not make those mistakes. Um, but, but these people are, the, are the, the, the people whom God points to in the Bible and says, these are, my, these, these are the ones who have got it. They've got it. Mm -hmm. Because they are faithful to me. They, they have faith in me. So I think maybe we ought not just kind of stress ourselves out about eating that jelly bean and whether it's a sin because it's unhealthy for you or whatever. <laughs> you know, we, um, you know, I heard it was a marshmallow. <laughs> yeah, well, the marshmallow is a whole different story. There's a much more egregious sin there. But, um, you know, and maybe just, I, you know, I, again, I'm not saying these things are not important. They are important. We should endeavor to, to, to make the best decision in every area of our life. But we can also just cut ourselves a little bit of slack sometimes and, and not stress ourselves out because we can lose sight of the, the important stuff here. Like <laughs> what matters at the end of the day, the only thing that matters at the end of the day is whether you have this faith in God, that, which is to say that you have this trust in him, that he is who he says he is and that he will do what he says he's going to do. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. This is what matters. Now, this faith is an action. I like this idea of, of faith being a verb. It is an action. It's something we get out there and we live out. All right. And I think you're, you, you'd you probably say that for some Christians, it's just a purely intellectual exercise. And that's not what the scriptures are talking about here. How was Abraham faithful? Because he left Ur. <laughs> that's, that's faith. It is an action. It is the doing the thing that God has called you to do. Um so, you know, I, I think we gotta we gotta emphasize that as well in our classes. It's not just a thought. It's not just a you know, intellectual thing. And you know, you you highlight the uh, living out the faith. And uh, I'll just point out for those who may not be aware, but when the Seventh Day Adventist Church came up with number twenty eight on the fundamental beliefs, number twenty eight was how do we live out what we believe. So I, I, I can tell you all day that I believe all 27 foundational beliefs and I, I can see it in the Bible and it's there and I, I believe it. But that's not the same as being convicted of it and letting the Holy Spirit live that out through my life. And yep. number 28 was all about overcoming. So, yes. I, I, you know, you, you always want me to go to Revelation, of course. So I, I think of the seven churches and every single church, Christ has the same message overcome, overcome, overcome. And I have to ask the question, do I really believe that I can overcome? Mm -hmm. I know what the text says. I know what the preacher says. But do I really believe that through the power of the Holy Spirit, I can overcome? Do I really accept that personally in my life? And well, there's the difference between those who are in Hebrews 11 in the faith chapter and those who are not. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Good. Now, you brought up something that's a nice natural segue to, to Monday, which is about Abraham's doubts. This is something we're gonna, we all have to wrestle with. What do we do here? How does he show his doubt? Well, you know, we see his concern. Whoop, I'm going to just, uh, there we go. That's where we want to do this change. But we see his concern in chapter 15 about having an error. Okay, that's the narrative issue that's at work in these chapters. He, he needs Terah, his father, had Abraham. Abraham needs his own heir. And he, you know, he got to the promised land at 75. We talked about last week. He's no spring chicken. And he thinks he's going to have to have his, uh, his servant become his heir. God says, no, I'm going to give you a son. So here we are in chapter 16. <laughs> God's like, well, I mean, Abraham's like, well, you know, maybe we can help God along here. What is this? An Egyptian an Egyptian slave named Hagar, which means, you know, we talked last week about how Pharaoh enriched Abram, despite, you know, because of his lie, in part because of his lie, uh, he enriched him with cattle, with, with animals, and with slaves. So this Hagar is a slave that was given to Abram, to his household, as a part of his deception in saying that, that Sarai was his sister, 
in Egypt. So, so he was being rewarded by Pharaoh with Hagar. So this is a, a shall we say, an ill-begotten gain. Hagar is. Now, this has nothing to do with whether Hagar was a good person or not. I, I, I tend to think that, you know, she tried to be as, as faithful as she could. And, and just because that's how she arrived in our story through, through ill-begotten means doesn't mean that she's a bad person. Um, we should be careful there with Hagar because, honestly, she acts a lot better than Sarah in this story. So, anyways, um, so Abram and, and Hagar get together. They knew each other. And uh, and they have and Hagar got pregnant and they have Ishmael again. I think this is going back to what you're saying with Dukan that we all have Abram as our father. Of course, the Muslims are going to say that Ishmael was the son of promise, and Christians and Jews are going to say no, Isaac is. But nevertheless, all claim Abram as our father. So, what a, what does this lesson know about Abram's doubts? What is Abraham doubting here? Well, I, I thought it was significant that the lesson or Dukan brings out that this, just like the detour, <laughs> or what he called the unfortunate detour to Egypt, in both accounts, there is a lack of talking to God. God mm-hmm. is absent from, from these two accounts. So you can see that here comes that that human side that says, I think I can figure this out. I, I think I can, I can make this work if I just do it my way. In both cases, God is absent from the story. And we're talking about, well, th- think about this now. You were just talking a few moments ago about Hagar and uh, how she looks pretty good compared to what Sarah is doing. But Sarah and Abraham are her masters. Yeah. I, I mean, that That'd be a pretty bold thing for a servant to go against the master's wishes. So it, it's not just it's not just a difference in terms of personalities or characters or actions. We're also talking about those individuals who profess to be following God suddenly yeah. come up with their own idea and now entice the lady from Egypt to do their bidding. Yeah. Out. Yeah, and you know, and it creates an impossible situation because. We often just say, well, Abraham slept with, with Hagar. But it's more than that because it says that um, uh, Sarai, took his, his wife, took her Egyptian slave Hagar and gave her t- to her husband to be his wife. The, the implication here that Hagar was, was Abram's wife just like Sarai was. But, but, hey, but one wife was also the servant of the other wife. That is a power... That is like a messed up power structure, okay? Because on one hand, you guys are both wives of Abram, which means you're both equal, but but one of the wives is a slave to the other. This cannot end well. It just cannot end well. Um, and, and, you know, and through the whole thing, Abram, he was the schemer in Egypt. Um, he's not the schemer here. Sarai is a schemer here. They both deserve each other. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> they both deserve each other for their schemes. You know, and Abram just seems all passive here, like, well, you know, I, I'm just going to, you know, <laughs> your slave is in your hands. I have no opinion about any of this stuff. Uh, <laughs> but, of course, he's an accomplice in this scheme, just uh, just as Sarai was in Egypt. Um, and, of course, they, they that, that Sarah mistreats Hagar, gets jealous, which is, of course, probably a very natural thing, um, unfortunately. And then here we have in verse 7, the angel of the Lord appears to Hagar. The angel appears out of nowhere, and it's not to Abraham, and it's not to Sarah, it's to Hagar. Man, God has compassion for the people who are the victim of of religious people's schemes. The people who are following God here hatched a, a dirty scheme, caught somebody else up in it. God has compassion for that person. <clears throat> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Oh, oh. You know, I... I, I might have mentioned this once, once before, but I do recall one of the most interesting sermons that I heard uh, come from Dwight Nelson over at Andrews University was in terms of Ishmael's line and the prophetic fulfillment. Uh, we, we don't talk much about that. And I think maybe it has a lot to do with present day uh, stressors between Christians and Muslims Mm -hmm. that we don't acknowledge and speak of it. But, you know, let's recall Ishmael, uh, Ishmael's name. 
was God hears. And not only did God hear, but he actually uh, laid out some promises for that young man's future in terms of his lineage. Yep. Yep. Yeah. And one could argue that the, the you know, there's so many Muslims around the world. And of course, uh, people who not, you know, it's, there's a religious element to that, that anybody can convert to Islam, but, but just native descendants of Ishmael. These are people who have inherited a promise of God. They did. Mm-hmm. And, and we should keep that in mind. It's a, it's always a reminder of our, how our schemes um, <laughs> and sometimes end up blessing other people, which thank God that it does do that. But, you know, it wasn't the, it wasn't the original goal here in this story. Okay, we're moving over to Tuesday now, the sign of the Abrahamic covenant. Okay, so we're in Genesis chapter 17, of course, another shot over to Romans 4, where Abraham has talked about. So we had a we had a story of Abram being you know wondering how is God going to fulfill this promise and in chapter uh, in chapter fifteen you know he wants an heir in chapter sixteen we see him try to get it with Ishmael not the right way apparently and now we're in chapter seventeen um, boy <laughs> we have a moment a kind of a breakthrough here with uh, with God so tell us what's going on here what is this covenant of circumcision what's a covenant because I don't think we have this. Uh, we have a little deal made with Noah, but what is this covenant all about? Why is circumcision the centerpiece of it? <laughs> well, you know, that this, this word covenant is unique because we tend to think of a covenant as an agreement, but yet these are covenants that God keeps on initiating. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, th- these guys haven't done anything to deserve these covenants. I mean, they're they're... They're chosen out of Babylon. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, what really struck me, and I guess I needed a kind of a reminding about this, uh, Dukan brings out the uh, fact that the circumcision also involves blood, that there is mm-hmm. a certain symbolism here that suggests something sacrificial as well. Mm-hmm. That, that might, I, I would suggest that the teachers take their time and kind of look over that piece uh, in their lesson because it's it, it's very uh, it'll, it'll slow you down. It'll make you think. <laughs> it'll, it'll definitely do both of those things. But I think what you're getting at here is, you know, it's not really a subject we really want to talk about. Let's be honest. Um, but wait, 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 wait. But no, 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 no. But it's important. <laughs> That's the point. But, it's important. But you know what? You you say it's as if we don't want to talk about it because it you know it seems kind no. of a little personal and such like that. Yeah. But let's keep in mind circumcision was something that was practiced by the people back then, just like baptism was practiced by people before John the Baptist came along. So it's interesting that God takes something that is common to that day and says, and now this is something you will continue to do, and this will be a sign. Mm. Yeah, hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's going to be a sign. Uh, that's for sure. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> anyways, there's so many things I could say about this. I'm going to refrain because there's only six and a half minutes. There's so many jokes. I actually am. Uh, I actually just used a circumcision joke in a sermon not too long ago. Uh, okay. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> at this with this covenant, Abraham, Abram's name is changed to Abraham, and Sarai's name is changed to Sarah. Finally, um, and and so there's this covenant. This is not this is a unilateral covenant, as you were getting at. It's a covenant God has made with them that does not require from them any kind of condition. That's in contrast to the Mosaic covenant, where God is saying, "I'm going to do this, and you're going to do this," hmm. and that's and, and if you don't hold up your end of the bargain, here are the consequences. Uh, this is a unilateral covenant with Abraham. This is what God's going to do for you. He's going to make you the father of uh, of, of many, so of many nations. And so yeah. it's it, you know obviously Abraham's past faithfulness is is something that contributed to God making this covenant. But it's not you know it's not conditional on Abraham doing something or not doing something. Uh, it's something that God decided he was going to do. All right. Yeah, and, and I think it speaks to the the nature of Abraham. He is a man of faith, despite yeah. all the weaknesses, despite the mistakes. He is a man of faith. Yes. 
Yes, yes, yes. Now, there is this point here in, in verse 9 where it says, you must keep my covenant, but, you know, the, the keeping of the covenant from Abraham's side is pretty much circumcision. <laughs> I think we could, we could say it's implied that Abraham is to continue being faithful and, and to teach his kids to be faithful and all this, but I'm just saying you don't have all 600 plus laws like you do with the Mosaic covenant, right? Now, here we have Abraham laughing. Is it, will a son be more into a man that's a hundred years old? Right, like this is after God repeats his his promise. Um, you know, it doesn't seem like he spoke this part out loud. And and, and Abraham says, but he, the part he does say out loud is, "If only Ishmael might live under your blessing." Like I've already got a son, just choose him. In other words, he's asking God to to kind of redeem the act of his own faithlessness. God, I, I went out on a limb and just did it the way I thought it should be. Can't you just validate that? Can't you just accept that? It's kind of like Cain offering his fruit, right? I, I, I'm bringing my fruit to the altar. Can't you just accept it? Now, again, this is nothing personal about Hagar, nothing personal about, about Ishmael. Both of them are, are very fine people in the scriptures, but it's just not the path God had chosen for, for Abraham. And, and God's basically telling him, uh, no. <laughs> I won't validate you guys going rogue on me and and doing in you know and just kind of your scheming. I'm not going to validate your scheming and make your scheming pay off for you. You're going to you know Sarah's going to get pregnant. That's the way I told you it was going to happen and it's the way it's going to happen. The end. <laughs> <laughs> but God does say I'm going to bless Ishmael. I'm going to bless Ishmael. He's not going to be punished because of what you guys have done. Um so all right. We're going to head over. we got just a few minutes left. We're going to go over the Wednesday here. The Son of Promise. At last, we have Genesis 18. And we're talking about some visitors that Abraham got. Uh, he's, he's chilling at the entrance of his tent. Three men are standing nearby. <laughs> and uh, when he saw him, he hurried over and bowed low to the ground, it says. It's like he instantly recognizes that these are no ordinary men, it seems. And what is he asking them to do? Please just don't pass by me. When you, when you see angels or when you see the presence of God near you and they're, you know, on the road or whatever, it's like, don't let the blessing pass by me. Don't let this opportunity pass by me. Please stay with me. Talk with me. You know, let's, let's spend some time together. Man, I tell you, if you're in your devotions, don't let the Holy Spirit just go on by you. Mm. Go tackle the Holy Spirit if you have to. <laughs> go wrestle with that angel if you have to. Don't let the blessing go. Okay. So what do we have here? Real quick, Jim, what you got on this I, day? You know, uh, a line that stood out, and I don't remember which book it was that uh, that I read this now, but anyways, where Dukan writes that hospitality is a religious duty. Mm. You know, we, we have our own ideas of what right or real religion is. But hospitality, a religious duty, I mean, he, it, in that one sentence, you, you just suddenly find yourself thinking of so many Old Testament prophets and what God asked us to do with regard to the poor and the widows and the children. And, and even it comes up again in the New Testament and in the life of Christ. Your religion, hmm, yeah. is it hospitable? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we think of what Jesus said. It's like uh, you could you could adapt it and say, uh, and, and when I was passing by your house, you stopped me and offered water. And when, Lord, did we do this? Right? I mean, it's it's the same kind of principle at work here. And yeah. so, they, yeah. they, you know, and now it's it's Sarah's turn to laugh. You, you see this, this pattern here of Abraham scheming and then Sarah schemes. Abraham laughs. Now Sarah laughs. I mean, these two are just two peas in a pod. They really are. <laughs> All right. And yet they it's not them who gets the last laugh. Oh. Come yeah. on. Come on. Yeah. Come on. Come on. Oh yeah. All, all right. <laughs> all right. And finally we have on Thursday Lot in Sodom. Of course Lot has uh, he just said he was going to live in that plain, he needed land for his crop, his uh, animals, but he ends up living in the city. And so Abraham had the rescue lot and Lot goes right back into Sodom. Oh, man. 
So give us your closing comments. Tell us what you think about Thursday, and then we'll we'll start wrapping this thing up as we're almost out of time. Well, I'll tell you, uh, one of the statements that came from uh, Patriarchs and Prophets in the lesson this week in talking about Sodom and then talking about the last days, uh, I was reading where she was talking about the pleasure-seeking throngs and the enjoyment of the hour, and I'll tell you, it uh, it can it can get come too close to home when we think of perhaps uh, where we are even as Christians today in terms of what we're looking for for pleasure and enjoyment and maybe it's not so different than Sodom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now a couple of things I I took away from here is you you kind of get these flood vibes. God's going to destroy this city, not the whole world, but the city. And Abraham's like, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> you know, we've gone through a catastrophic destruction before. You know, if, if you find, aren't, aren't there some good people there in Sodom? Aren't there some good people? I mean, I think in Abraham's mind, there's got to, you know, he stops at, um, you know, he's like, is there's 50 people, you know, okay. And Abraham goes, what about there's 45 people? What if there's 40 you know, what if there's 20? What if there's 10? Because I think in Abraham's mind, there's got to at least be 10 good people in that city. There's got to at least, you know, Lot's got to have friends. <laughs> you know, and, and so I think from his perspective, you know, I think Abram's done a safe thing where it's like God can't destroy the city. Uh, now, there's got to be more than 10 people, right? It's going to be perfectly fine. You know, but so I think that the city is worse than what Abraham thinks. But at the same time, and this is something I think we can take as Adventists, is we are used to just bemoaning and decrying the world. Abraham intercedes for Sodom. Mm -hmm. And I think that challenges us. Our, you know, we can complain about Hollywood, and we can complain about politics, and we can complain about all these things. And obviously, you know, Sodom is bad. Obviously, there's a lot of immorality around us. But are we interceding for our country? Are we interceding for Hollywood? Are we interceding for our political leaders, praying that God would save them? Wow. Does this include presidents of both parties? Uh, it includes everybody. <laughs> Inclu but, <laughs> but includes everybody. You know, and, hey, and you that's know, a, oh, go ahead. No, I was just going to throw out, you, you know, I enjoy revelation. You know, I enjoy symbolism. And, you know, this, this 10 here, Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we, we've come down, this 10 throughout scripture is a number of testing. Mm. And we, we did not, uh, or I did not bring this up earlier, but even when we were uh, looking here over the lesson this past week, and uh, we were looking at the prophecy relating to the 400 years that Israel would be in slavery. Yeah. Why 400? Well, because 40 is the number of testing and probation throughout the Old and New Testament, and so is 10. And 10 times 40 gives you the 400. Now we come down here to this 10 here with Abraham, and guess what? Mm. They, there's not even enough people in the city to reach the 10. They could not even reach the limit yeah. that God had for the testing number. Yeah, yeah. Well, well said, well said. Only got four in the end. Lot, his wife, and, and their two daughters, the sons-in-laws, didn't make it. And uh, it's, it's, it's another yeah. tragic thing, right? It's like a little mini yeah. flood story. Well, that's it. And isn't it interesting that we, we don't just have like one faithful individual who comes out of the flood or who comes out of this story. It's, it's always a family unit. I, mm -hmm. I just find that very interesting. Yeah. Well, they're going to be down one uh, <laughs> on the way out of the what? city. <laughs> yeah, they're down one, but remember, they come out of the ark, and all of a sudden, we have yeah, a story yeah, about yeah. one goes down, yeah. you know? Yep, 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 yep. Oh, it's true. It's true, and we're going to have a very similar story here. Uh, it's, it's a recurring problem that human beings have to keep dealing with, that even when they get saved, sometimes they just turn around and do some kind of nonsense. Um, so we got to check ourselves. All right, that's all the time we got. We are a little bit past our zero, zero, zero on our clock. So thank you so much for joining me for Lesson 7 and, and for joining us for Lesson 7, talking about the covenant with Abraham. As usual, we left so much on the table, so much more that could be said, especially about Sodom at the end. Um, but hey, we're challenging ourselves with this 25 minutes. So I think by the time we get down the week, uh, Lesson 13, we'll have it down 
pretty, pretty, really well. Hopefully this is something that will inspire you as a Sabbath school class member or teacher to, to get the most out of your class, all right? And we want to see people grow in our churches through a fruitful and vibrant Sabbath school class. That's why we do Sabbath school boot camp. And we thank you guys so much for watching. We will see you next week with Lesson 8. And I'm going to guess we're going to talk about Abraham a little bit again. <laughs> All right. We'll see you then. <laughs>